Over the course of this series, we've discussed a number of designs, with some being more ridiculous than others. With most of them, however, there usually is a decent amount of work put into the project to make it a reality. Today's video is a bit different though, as it was never pursued and only created as a concept. The tank design is so outlandish, I just had to make a video on it though. Today on Curse by Design, we delve into the weird world of Frank Tinsley and his concept for a submarine tank. Trust me, it's even crazier than you can imagine. Throughout history, there have been countless tanks, all designed to kill. But not all have been a success. What happened to the ones that never made it, and why did they fail? My name is Konavar. Join me as we journey through time, uncovering failed projects and forgotten creations in Cursed by Design. This video has been sponsored by Skillshare. Skillshare is a community-driven learning platform that allows you to develop new skills, unleash your creativity, or even improve on an existing passion. Maybe you want to design your own concept vehicles like the one we'll be talking about today. Skillshare offers a plethora of classes which can help you get started or move to the next level in your ability to do so. One of the classes that caught my eye was Concept Art, Drawing Imaginary Worlds by Ira Marks, which is a great place to start. Skillshare is offering the first 1,000 of my viewers who click the link below a full month of Skillshare completely free. So head down there and grab your free month before it's gone. Thanks so much to them for sponsoring my content, now let's get into today's video. During World War II, amphibious tanks became a common sight on the battlefield, especially in the Pacific, with a number of specially designed tanks as well as modified vehicles. Some of the more well-known of these include the D-Day tanks and the LVT series of tanks. However, these designs still expose the crew to shore emplacements which often could punch through the thinner armor of the light amphibious craft. So what is a designer to do? Following the end of World War II, an article by the previously mentioned Frank Tinsley was published in the Mechanics Illustrated magazine from December 1950. He begins in a similar way to how I started this video by detailing the early designs used by the US in amphibious assaults. The most common one, known as the LVT, actually began as a vehicle known as the Alligator. This was an amphibious tractor developed by Donald Roebling to be used for search and rescue in the Florida swamps. Before it was even put into production for its intended role, the design caught the eye of the Marine Corps which quickly saw it modified for military use. Despite later upgrades to the design which helped improve its performance on land, the LVT still was lightly armored in a large target. Not exactly a great combination for an armored vehicle that is likely to come under heavy fire. Clearly an improvement was needed, and with war breaking out in June of 1950 on the Korean Peninsula, our boy Frank had an ambitious solution. Rather than lighten the tank to allow it to float, thus putting it at risk of enemy fire, why not create a tank which can approach a landing zone along the sea floor? Not only would this allow the tank to have heavier armor, but could revolutionize the way naval landings were performed. I can definitely see the appeal, considering the old method consisted of an armored landing craft with the sole purpose of dumping soldiers onto a beach unprotected. So how was something like this to be accomplished? I'm going to start by reading directly from the article so you can hear the exact description of the machine he envisioned. Then we can take a step back and break down what exactly this bizarre design would be. If an adequately armored tank is too heavy to float, why not let it sink to the bottom and roll up to the beach underwater? It needs only suitable sealing, a temporary air supply, and a means of guiding it along passable ocean bed trails. Let's take a look at the technical problems involved. The alligator and water buffalo, plus several pre-war amphibious tank designs, have proved that watertight armored hulls can be successfully combined with practical track gear. So far as underwater sealing, air supply, and seafloor operation are concerned, a working prototype already exists. See the Undersea Explorer's Submarine in the June 1950 issue of MI. It is true that this machine is designed like a baby submarine with track gear, it has none of the armament, free-swinging turrets, etc. that a fighting tank requires, but these are problems that can be licked too if we set our mind to it. The hull, with its escape hatches, air inlet, and exhaust ports, present no great difficulties. All have been long since solved in standard submarine practice. The main problem lies in the turret. Here we are faced with an entirely separate unit, mounting a heavy, long-barreled gun. It must be capable of 360 degree rotation and its gun must have a 90 degree elevation. Mounted on a motor driven ball bearing traversing ring, it is difficult to render watertight, especially since the gun and turret must be free to swing into action as soon as the tank emerges from the water. And whatever freeing is necessary should be done from inside the tank. 
If we can't waterproof the turret itself, why not cover the whole thing with something that can be waterproofed? Let's take our cue from aircraft design. The modern jet fighter faces a similar problem in a different medium. The pilot's cockpit is like a fishbowl in reverse. Surrounded by a thin, icy air of extreme altitudes, it must be kept filled with heavy, breathable air, warm to the proper temperature and enriched with oxygen. This means that the cockpit enclosure must be airtight, strong enough to resist wide differentials in pressure and transparent enough for good visibility. Also, it must be attached so it can be jettisoned instantly to permit escape in an emergency. Here may be our answer. Anchored in a rim molded into the tank's hull just outside the turret can be mounted a heavy dome of clear plastic enclosing the movable components in a rigid, waterproof shell. Inside this bubble-like canopy, the tank's retractable periscope will revolve, giving its crew a full 360-degree field of underwater vision. Upon reaching the surface, the dome is blown clear of the tank by small explosive charges placed around the rim, as in the standard fighter plane enclosures. A suitable type of clear plastic, methods of fabrication, optical curves, rim fastening, gaskets, and jettison equipment are all available and easily adaptable to tank requirements. The sole remaining stumbling block is the long-barreled 90mm gun. Luckily for us, the rapid acceptance of the recoilless type of cannon solves this problem. Light in weight and comparatively short-barreled, this new piece of ordnance is made to order for tank use. With no recoil travel to consider, it can be fitted entirely inside the wide, dome-like turret with just an inch or two of muzzle protruding. Using rocket-boosted shells with shape-charged noses, its muzzle velocity and penetration is easily the equal of conventional anti-tank artillery. With a 105mm recoilless gun mounted in one side of the turret, a powerful flame projector balancing it on the other side, and a battery of machine guns buried in an independently rotating top section above, our tank is more heavily armed than any existing model and all these stingers can be housed compactly beneath the waterproof dome. In the drawing on pages 74 and 75, the tank is shown with side fenders, which can be raised during land travel to act as seats for soldiers or for carrying equipment. Our tanks would arrive off an enemy coast in standard seagoing LSTs. As in wartime landing operations, the top deck would be packed solid with jeeps, half-tracks, and trucks loaded with fuel, ammo, and supplies to implement follow-up tank assaults. Like Europe of an earlier era, we are involved in a life-and-death struggle against the craftily-led hordes of Asia. We cannot hope to match them in sheer manpower. Our only chance is to beat them with the superior weapons and know-how. A combination of Western science, Yankee ingenuity, and the willingness to try anything is our only hope. An undersea tank may prove to be one of the weapons we need. Why don't we have it? When I first found this article and the pictures showing his idea, I was instantly enamored by it. The absurd yet well-conceived design just stuck in my head as I'm sure it has for many of you already. Let's break down exactly what it is we're looking at though and see if it's an actually viable vehicle. Obviously, as this tank was never built, we can only make assumptions on the dimensions from the images. Knowing that this would have likely been used primarily for naval landings, we can assume the armor would probably not need to be as thick as a normal tank. I assume we would be looking at around 75 to 100 millimeters on the front with considerably less on the sides. Keep in mind this is just my best guess and might not even need to be that thick. As for the mobility, we can clearly see wide tracks which makes sense given it would need good grip to move along the soft seabed and other soft terrain. Other than that, we get no real indication of what sort of drivetrain or power plant it would have possessed. However, it likely would have needed some sort of hybrid electric system since otherwise their crew would quickly be suffocated by fumes or have the engine cut out from lack of air. Next we move on to the armament, which is surprisingly detailed compared to the other design elements. Featuring a 105mm recoilless rifle, likely the M27 recoilless rifle, alongside a flamethrower with an additional four machine guns in a separately rotating position, similar to the later M48 Coppola. We can clearly see several viewports and a tall periscope, although I do have to question exactly how well you would be able to really see the enemies through them. Finally, we get to the most interesting feature of this concept, the plastic dome. As mentioned in the article, sealing a tank can be quite tricky, especially with the area around the turret often having necessary gaps to allow it to move. Obviously, the tank needs to be sealed in a way that didn't require the crew to get out on the beach to remove anything, as that would completely defeat the purpose of the entire design. Instead, the crew could simply detonate small charges to blow the clear dome free from the tank, freeing its turret for use after exiting the water. I imagine these domes could also be recovered following the landing to allow them to be reused, so I think it's quite a clever concept. Is this tank really feasible though? That question is tricky to answer because of how many factors are left unknown. 
From my basic understanding, the concept could definitely be made to work if the conditions were correct, but I find it quite likely that this would rarely be the case. We can see from early attempts to create submersible tanks during World War II by the Germans that these tanks are likely to become stuck in the mud if the seafloor is anything but the perfect type of terrain. Granted, the Americans would have had better technology by the 50s than the Germans had while trying to design their submersible tanks, but the hurdles would not have changed. Most modern tanks nowadays have the ability to cross rivers using special snorkels, but that is usually only very short distances, so although it proves it can be done, it's not quite a direct comparison. In my opinion, although in a different timeline this could have been a very successful design were it to be done correctly, wars in our timeline would not have been kind to this concept. With advances in air power and helicopters, naval landings have become much less common than in World War II and the Korean War. Although this could be partially due to the fact that there haven't really been any engagements which required a naval landing in recent times, I think it still goes to show how the need for this Panzer of the Sea would have quickly vanished. Not to mention, we've seen advancements in our landing craft technology as well. This would mean any design which could only serve the specific purpose of naval attacks with a cost as high as an underwater tank would entail more than likely would have been mothballed quickly. But that's just my opinion on the design. The great thing about this tank being purely conceptual is it allows us the freedom to speculate about its every aspect. I'd love to hear what your opinions are in the comments. Do you agree with me that the design could have worked if the concept was attempted, or do you think this is nothing more than a sensational design which thankfully remained on the pages of a magazine? I'd also like to know what you guys think of this slightly different style of video. I've recently discovered the rabbit hole of military concepts from magazines in the 50s and even earlier, especially those of Frank Tinsley. If you'd like to see more wacky ideas that people from those days came up with, let me know and I might even break it off into its own series or something. Thank you all so much for watching, please leave a like if you enjoyed it since it really helps the channel out, and if you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing. One last thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video, and don't forget to click that link down below so you can be one of the 1000 to get that free trial. I'll see you in the next video.